We've talked a lot about how the pandemic has made the problems of finding truth, or sense-making, much harder, and how it's made the gap between the mainstream and the alternative, the consensus and the anti-consensus, even bigger. It's the uncanny valley that we've talked about before. A couple of days ago, the podcaster Joe Rogan, the alpha dog of the alternative media, hosted mainstream CNN medical correspondent Sanjay Gupta for what's probably the most high-profile dialogue across the valley so far. I wanted to have you on, first of all, because I really respected that you made this change of opinion publicly. I, I thought that's a real, a, a real thinking person who is trying to honestly figure out what's going on instead of just working on being right. Well, I, look, I, I appreciate that. I spoke to Dr. Zubin Damania about this clash between the mainstream and the alternative. The, they ended it by saying, Agupta said, you know, Joe, I, I like the way you think. And not what you think about, not what you believe, I like the way you think. And Rogan said, I like the way you think. And I thought that was really, really, really good because then it, it establishes this, oh, hey, we're having a dialogue. I respect your thought process. I may disagree, but you're, you're clearly not acting in bad faith. And uh, this was a conversation worth having. I feel better for having had it. Th that's phenomenal. And in particular, the need for heterodox thinking. We need heterodoxy more than ever, in especially in healthcare, especially in public policy. We need to question every single existing belief that we have because because they need to be questioned. I'm telling you, as somebody <laughs> who's worked in the space, like most of what we do is garbage. It's worse than garbage. It's harmful. Hope you enjoy the film. And if it sparks questions, please add them into the comments and hopefully we'll be able to answer them in a future conversation. So Zubin Demania, welcome back. Thanks for having me, David. It's a joy. Awesome. So We've been talking quite a lot behind the scenes for quite a while uh, and keeping in contact during this whole kind of last couple of months and sharing a real interest in like sense making, heterodoxy and the pandemic and both feeling like it's such a test of all of those things. Well, certainly of sense making and of heterodoxy. And I think that of all the people I've spoken to and I've connected with uh, like many, many people over the last kind of couple of months in doctors and kind of involved in this debate, I think you've probably got the greatest instinctive grasp of heterodoxy. You talk about the alt middle, uh, you talk a lot about, you use um, integral theory, you use Jonathan Haidt's moral matrices to understand people's different kind of reactions to things like vaccine passports, mandates. And you've got uh, very sort of counter mainstream views on some things. Um, you're also a trained doctor, so you've got kind of that level of expertise as well. Um, I guess let's start, and you've also criticized the medical establishment at the beginning of the pandemic. I think I played the clip in the last conversation we had. You, you said you hoped that COVID was the, the thing that would burn this system to the ground. COVID-19 will be the catalyst that burns this broken system to the ground. But this has been a huge test for sense making and I think heterodoxy in particular, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how I think that's shown up. And um, we'll also talk about um, the recent Joe Rogan, uh, Sanjay Gupta film, uh, which just came out. We'll touch on vaccines, ivermectin, and, but in particular like sense making and communicating across the divides. Um, but maybe before we d dive into that, what, what are you making of, you've got a shared interest in sense making, making sense of this, you're a communicator. Where are you feeling like things are at now, sort of as big picture as we can go? Mm. Yeah, oh, for, first I have to say like, David, since I've met you, I've, you know, I have these instincts about sense making and, and you know, again, I call it alt middle, it's really integral. And I've read a lot of Ken Wilber and John Hyde, like you say, but, since meeting you, I've learned so much more from both you and your audience about the subtleties of this, you know, whether it's game B, whether it's connecting with Daniel Schmachtenberger, who is just, you're just like, oh my God, like that, yes. Uh, and and those some of that nuance is starting to fill in and I'm recognizing my own sort of biases in a way that I wasn't able to before. So it, it is useful. I think where we are now in in all of this, man, you know, and I keep t I keep telling you kind of offline, man, I'm just not 
COVID is not interesting anymore because it, 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 you know, we, we see it play out. I kind of know the general dynamics of it. We have these vaccines, we have these strategies. It's like, it's gonna end. So the COVID is less interesting than the meta COVID, <laughs> like the sense-making crisis around COVID. And, and what's happened since we talked last, I think is um, I put out a few little pieces on, on really understanding why it is people wouldn't wanna get vaccinated, why mandates feel terrible and probably are terrible and on a lot of levels, why uh, a, a, a mother would not choose to vaccinate their child against a disease that has very low risk for the child, but the vaccine has some risk in terms of myocarditis. And there's a nuance in that, which we'll get into, I'm sure. But, and, and so I got a lot of emails from people saying, hey, you know what? You're the only person in the medical profession that doesn't sound completely crazy, who is understanding our position and articulating it and not screaming about it. And, and so can you answer these questions of mine? And normally, you know how it is, you, you'll get you know, hundreds of emails a day or direct messages and all that, and, and you can't answer them all, so you, you, know, you do your best to pick and choose. But with this, I've made it a point of any vaccine-related kind of question I try to answer. And what I'm realizing is this is the, it's the sense-making disaster. People don't know who to trust. They don't trust CDC, they don't trust the government, they don't trust pharma, but they also have this intuition that, hey, I don't wanna get COVID if I haven't had it. Uh, and they want a trusted person to make sense of it. And the question is how, how can any one person do that? And that's the big challenge. So I try to, first of all, align with their belief and their, their sort of bias and then say, okay, well, but here's my best understanding of this. And this is what, if you were a loved one of mine, what I might hope you would do, but ultimately whatever decision you make is the right decision for you because you've had information now to make the decision. But it, it's been really, it's been intense. Mm. Yep, it's definitely been intense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, there's a few things that we're, we're gonna talk about. I mean, I feel like the question of what is a heterodox take in the pandemic or in COVID is such a complex one. I think the simplified version of the argument on many different sides, like on one side, I think the sort of, let, let, let's use Peter Lindbergh's framing of COVID thesis, antithesis, synthesis, because I think that's a really useful way, useful framing, useful kind of heur heuristic to use. So Peter Lindbergh, who runs the STOA, put out a piece talking about the COVID thesis, which he described as kind of the perspective that lockdowns are needed to contain the virus, masks work and need to be mandated, vaccines are safe, people should take the vaccine to protect themselves and others, vaccine passports open things up and quicker and encourage those who are hesitant to get vaccinated. I'll probably add to that and that mandates are a good idea and, and work to get people vaccinated. The antithesis position Lockdowns are not needed, masks do not work, the safety and efficacy of the vaccines are being oversold, vaccine passports will not only fail but further segregate society, and in the near future we can expect a scapegoating of the, um, scapegoating of the unvaccinated. In other words, we're positioned on the precipice of a slippery slope that leads towards increasingly draconian biopolitical control measures, the grip of which is unlikely to release even once the pandemic is over. And I'd also add to that um, antithesis position that and ivermectin is very efficacious, potentially could it end the pandemic and is being unjustly suppressed by big pharma, which is something we'll, we'll get to in a bit. And obviously both of those perspectives have some validity. Like we do need to be very worried about um, the civil rights implications. We need to be worried about the surveillance and there are valid questions, valid concerns about novel vaccines and all of these questions, but then the synthesis position, there doesn't seem to be any real attempt or even an arena for the synthesis. And it's something that we've talked before and I've talked before about the uncanny valley between the mainstream and the alternative. And in a minute we'll talk about Sanjay Gupta from CNN coming on Joe Rogan was kind of an, a perfect example of that. Like the, the archetypal kind of mainstream media figure on the most successful podcast in the world. And we'll talk about that in a way in a moment. But just from that sort of broader COVID antithesis, thesis, synthesis perspective, do you find that a useful framing? 
I thought it was a. I thought Peter did a great job in that framing. It's interesting though because I think he focused. The only the only feedback I would have on that is when you look at the antithesis position, there's a little political element drawn in there, right? Like there's this creeping authoritarian creep, et cetera. You you should also then add that political element to the thesis position because I think it's there as well, which is the you know, we need systems thinking, we need some more more sort of top-down management because to some degree, people if left on their own, they have imperfect knowledge, imperfect education. We, the authorities have better education, like, you know, let's impl implement it for the good of everybody. And I think it's a, it's a well-intentioned position on both sides, but the other side sees it as an ill-intentioned position because of the ideological, like uh, underpinnings of whatever their moral, you know, matrix is. So I, I thought it was really, I thought that was great. And when you had sent me that to me and I, I read it with great interest because I thought, you know, the idea of the synthesis position is again, we have all these names, you know, I came up with this I, or stole it. I don't know where I got it. Alt middle um, integral, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a holistic synthesis of saying yes and, or true, but partial, like everything is true, but partial. And I think you said it, there's some truth on all sides of this. Now, the question then is, if you had a perfect computer that could measure outcomes uh, perfectly, you could, you know, and Sam Harris speculates about this, right? When he talks about morality, like absolute morality, like if you're measuring, if you have a machine that could measure absolute morality in terms of the suffering of conscious beings, um, well, do you have a machine that can measure the perfect outcomes of COVID in terms of suffering, death, and economic damage? Well, then you could design policies that are just the most optimizing. We don't have that. So we have to find, you know, a balance between what our moral intuition says, what data we have, how we spin that data. Like Sanjay Gupta is going to look at the same piece of data differently than Joe Rogan's going to look at it. Um, or, you know, your synthesis and your, your thesis and antithesis positions. And that's the motivated reasoning. That's the, you know, uh, confirmation bias, all of those things that are these kind of logical fallacies that we have. So the idea of an emergent synthesis space or an S space, we can call it, right? Where you, you can all say it's a sense-making space. Um, that hasn't existed really. And you, you're trying to do it with rebel wisdom, which is great. Um, I try to do it, although I have my own biases and I sometimes look at my pieces and I'm like, I'm taking more of the antithesis position or then there's days when I take a, such a strong uh, thesis position that I, I get a ton of hate. And the question is, then you just have to do a rant where you're like, here's the synthesis, <laughs> you know? Like you can interview a guy like Paul Offit who is very thesis. Like he's the definition of the thesis position. A virologist invented a vaccine, you know, he actually himself is quite a heterodox guy when it comes to medical interventions. He wrote a book that basically said most of what we do doesn't work and yet we think it does. And the things that do work like vaccines, we kind of go, oh, those don't work. So it is interesting, but then how do you emerge the synthesis? I think that's gonna be the great challenge of the next phase of our you know, thinking and evolution. Mm. Yeah, and obviously I've delved to some degree into things over the last kind of couple of months from a fairly standing start and tried to talk to as many kind of medical professions as I could and kind of renegade medical professionals and people from all over the sort of different spectrum and kind of reading lots of the, 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 the stuff that's out there. Um, and the, the position that I've kind of ended up with is this sense that there are such simplified positions on both sides. And in particular, this kind of assumption on the more, obviously I'm more aligned with the kind of heterodox side. That's where a lot of our audience have been built up. It's, we followed the intellectual dark web, kind of started from that sort of position. Uh, and I think there's been such a rift within the heterodox world over this. I mean, you saw very high profile fallings out between Brett Weinstein and Sam Harris, for example. Claire Lehman of Quillette as well, I think has left Twitter because of far too much, um, yeah, the controversy and the, um, I think Quillette was, was, a lot of people felt Quillette had let them down by taking such a sort of firm pro-vaccine position. I think it's fair to say it's not just the position that was taken, it was also a sort of what they felt was a kind of slightly hectoring style 
in terms of um, Claire and, and, and Quillette, which I can understand. I think that's what people that's what people react to the most, I think, rather than the content. It's the tone or the feeling of like, um, the feeling of like the only reason that you wouldn't get vaccinated is that you're an anti-vax lunatic or whatever, like that sense of kind of sneering or judgment that's coming down. Um, but, but on the other side, this sense that there's a, there seems to be a belief on the contrarian stroke heterodox side that everyone, all doctors are kind of basically parroting or lockstep with the CDC. And what I discovered was, no, there's a, there's a huge amount of discussion, there's a huge amount of debate, there's a huge amount of division among doctors to do with things like the risk benefits of vaccinating children, the benefits of masks, um, and, and a lot of the like natural immunity versus vaccine immunity, like all of these different questions, there's actually a healthy debate. And people, because they have a fairly low resolution opinion of what's going on or view of what's going on, they don't, they don't see that. They don't see that there's actually quite a healthy debate and quite a healthy discussion about a lot of things that would be considered heterodox or antithesis positions. And what I saw was this big conflating of heterodoxy and contrarianism with a particular small camp of vaccine skepticism, allied with, with a very small number of names. Uh, obviously, the Dark Horse podcast, Robert Malone, Steve Kirsch. It's actually a very small number of people that are driving that particular kind of viewpoint. Not to say there's no signal there or there's no, no validity. I mean, we'll come to maybe some of their claims. But there's a sort of 80-20 principle of a lot of the, the things that people say. Like if you listen to someone who's a vaccine skeptic, like we'll come to Joe Rogan and Sanjay Gupta in a moment. Like a lot of the stuff that... that um, Joe says, and, and Brett says to some degree, 80% of it is actually there is a healthy debate going on. Myocarditis, um, risk benefit ratios of vaccinating children, um, et cetera, et cetera. Like a lot of these topics are being discussed. And it's just that last 20% where it sort of veers off into, and the spike protein is toxic, ivermectin is 100% effective at preventing COVID all of these things, and you're just like, whoa, hang on. And that then gets, by some people, associated with the heterodox or the control, well, the heterodox position. And then you're arguing between two very low resolution perspectives, and you don't realize that there's actually a lot of shared ground in the middle, and heterodoxy means way more than just vaccine skepticism. And there's been this conflation of contrarianism, heterodoxy with vaccine skepticism. There's another issue about th there's no, I'm not seeing any platforms where those narratives are being challenged or those narratives are coming together. Like Robert Malone, for example, has anyone seen Robert Malone being interviewed or being in dialogue with someone who disagrees? Like you you're not seeing a lot of these people in interviews or dialogues with people who are actually challenging them. That that's another kind of issue. But yeah, what do you make of that kind of overlap? Like. The sense that heterodoxy is more than just vaccine skepticism is is the, the point that I'm, I guess I'm making. Man, it's so frustrating, you know? Because what it does is it actually harms the heterodox cause. Like we need heterodoxy more than ever in, especially in healthcare, especially in public policy. We need to question every single existing belief that we have because because they need to be questioned. I'm telling you, as somebody <laughs> who's worked in the space, like most of what we do is garbage. It's worse than garbage. It's harmful. And in that, and what happens is, you know, like in peacetime, you know, my friend Vinay Prasad, Dr. Vinay Prasad, talks about this quite a bit. In peacetime, it's one thing for the scientific community to say, you know what, we have a pretty strong stance on these vaccines for kids. You know, we have a long, decades long track record the people who generally are opposing these generally are these entrenched activist fringe communities. We need to be very aggressive about it. Then they drag that same ideology into a COVID situation where we have new vaccines, a question, an age distribution that's not the childhood vaccine age distribution, it's the opposite, it's older people dying of this. And then people with legitimate questions are painted with the same brush as during peacetime you're painting anti-vaccine delusional activists. Well, 
this is not good. So that triggers then the heterodox community to go, who are these people? They're condescending to us. They're speaking in absolutes, right? Which is always concerning for um, a, a heterodox person because you go, well, they, they, we know that nothing is absolutely correct, right? For everybody. So you lose that, but then, so what, who fills the void when mainstream actors in this are behaving this way? Well, a guy like Malone appears, a guy like, you know, Steve Kirsch appears, a guy like Pierre Corey appears, who on the surface have pretty good credentials, who are very articulate, who are clearly intelligent, who probably are also quite well-intentioned, but they have a fringe position that then becomes entrenched by the criticism they're getting. So their emotional reactance is probably entrenching them further. Like there's no, I mean, again, and I, I, this is a mind reading fallacy. So I'm not gonna try to mind read Pierre Corey or whoever, but it feels like when you uh, watch this that they're getting so much criticism from their own tribe that it's generating a reactance where they're entrenching and they're becoming more absolute. And, and then they're painting that tribe with the brush if they're all regulatorily captured, they're all captured by pharma. You cannot trust a single doctor to do the right thing. In fact, Corey really exudes this kind of thing. Like my own tribe are dropping the ball on this and so on. And that's, look, that can be true on many things. But in this case, it's like, well, like you said, David, when <laughs> when you actually talk to physicians in the community, there's a nuanced discussion and thinking that's already going on. Nobody is lockstepping in anything. Now, there are groups of physicians who actually turn to people like myself and Vinay and Paul Offit and across the spectrum to kind of educate themselves because they're busy in the trenches of doing what they're doing and they can't like dig into all the nuance of every you know, piece of misinformation. But in general, um, this discussion's happening. That's why when I watched the Rogan um, Gupta thing, and I was expecting, oh, this is going to be a sh total shit show, and you know, every, all the little clips I've been seeing, I was like, oh my gosh. Then you watch it, and you're like, hey, this was actually a reasonable discussion where there was some nuance. There, you can criticize little components of it, and we will. But I, but I, I remember thinking, oh, this is a good three hour discussion, uh, and this is the kind of discussions that ought to be happening at dinner tables around the country. Um, so I think to some extent we're the victims of a, like you said it, you said there's a low resolution appreciation for what's really happening. Like how do we get a higher, how do we increase the resolution of the understanding of what the dialogue really is, you know? Especially when families are torn apart, torn apart by it because they're stuck in these media silos, these social media silos, you know, heterodox versus mainstream. Mm. Yeah, let's, um, you've already turned to the Gupta Rogan episode, so let's maybe dive in. And you're right, it's fascinating. Like there's been the clips that are now sort of doing the rounds on social media feel really heavily kind of weaponized. Like there's the one about ivermectin and there's also the one about vaccines. And I've seen them shared with a like, oh, Joe Rogan lambast destroys Sanjay Gupta. And listening, and, and I, I had the same feeling. Like I was like, oh, this is obviously a shit show. and. I kind of reacted to it as if it was definitely a shit show because it, it's set up to be a shit show. I mean, CNN correspondent goes on Joe Rogan. But actually, it's, it's, very, it's much better than that. It, it was very friendly. Uh, certainly at the beginning, there was a kind of, I saw, thought Sanjay did really well. And it just showed that, there, that a dialogue is possible. Like uh, Joe, I think, is, is dialoguing with people who, who disagree, which... Not everyone in this space is by any means. I mean, I've, I've said that quite a few times and that's been the great tragedy is that many people have not been dialoguing. I think they've established themselves with certain positions very firmly and that's meant that it's very difficult for them to then question those positions and maybe kind of accept that, that there are things that they're not including in those positions. Um, but, but yeah, I thought given, given the way that it's been portrayed on social media, it was actually a really good conversation. There were a few sort of points of division and we'll talk about whether you think that Rogan was in the right or Gupta was in the right. And I think, am I right in thinking that some of them you'd agree with Rogan, some of them you'd agree with, with Gupta? Is that fair, yeah. Enough? fair enough? Yeah. What did you make of it in, in total, given you thought it was going to be a shit show as well? Yeah, you know, and, and I watched it at 3.5x, which, now this is an actually interesting meta meta thing. So you got a three hour and 20 minute thing in the attention economy, that's an eternity, right? And yet 
you need to watch the whole thing to get the gist of what's going on. You will not emerge a synthesis from that piece by watching sound bites of it. That's the problem. The vast majority of Americans are gonna watch the sound bites of it and come up with their own conclusion based on their previous motivated reasoning on, on ideology and how they feel about Rogan, how they feel about CNN. How, are they left-leaning, right-leaning, libertarian? So watching the whole thing at three, three and a half X changes the flow and the dynamic of the interaction a little bit. So it almost felt like Rogan was stomping on Gupta a bit at three and a half X. Cause you know, Gupta would be like, oh, and he'd be like, what, uh, isn't he lying? Isn't CNN lying? They're lying about this, right? They're lying. And it just, so it does change the feel a little, but I think I got the gist of it. And this is what, this is what I, I felt. I actually had a pretty reasonable conversation where Gupta got out the ideas he needed to get out and Rogan asked the questions he wanted to ask and pushed on some of the things that I think had generated emotional reactants in Rogan, which was CNN taking a shit on him for calling you know, his taking of ivermectin a, a veterinary medicine product, which it is, it is and it is also not, it's also a human product. And I thought it was interesting that Rogan kept referring that to that as a lie. I know Rogan uses that language actually. He, Ro Rogan has used that language with me when I've dialogued with him in the past about guests he's had on his show. They straight up lied to me. And when you actually look at what was happening, the way Rogan describes a lie, it's, it's a partial truth or a slightly misleading thing. But, you know, whereas I think of lie as an intentional mistruth, like you're, you're trying to deceive someone. So there's semantics there, but my sense of the overall picture of it was, oh, you could watch this and actually have a reasonable understanding of both sides of this issue with knowing the bias of each side, knowing that I don't think Gupta is the best person to do that for a variety of reasons. I don't think he can be very authentically him because he's beholden to CNN and so on. And I think having a, a scientist like, you know, a Paul Offit or a Vinay Prasad on there who could actually go deeper, even deeper on the science would have been good because Rogan has an innate curiosity that I think would have been really piqued by going deep on that stuff. You have two communicators talking to each other. That, I mean, that's great for an audience, but not so great for each communicator because it's like, oh, game recognize game. I see what you're doing there. You're spinning it a certain way. And oh, I see what Rogan's doing. And so, from that standpoint, watching it as a fellow communicator too, I thought, ah, oh, okay, okay, okay. But I would love to see, you know, a, a deeper dive in, into the the science of this. So, and and you can recognize, you know, Rogan's really pounding on Gupta for certain things that he would never have pounded on Brett or Corey or Malone for. So you know Rogan's bias there, and that's okay. Rogan, I don't think Rogan calls himself a journalist or anything, right? But um, you have to have some meta awareness of what's going on. But I actually thought, you know, and I, I wrote down a list of everything they talked about and I did a little show on it yesterday, trying to go through some of that science. And since then I've learned a little bit more, but I thought it was, I thought it was really a good thing they did that. And I think that degree of, of nuanced conversation for three hours, if people can actually watch it, they, they would get something out of it. Mm. Yeah, and let's maybe start with the ivermectin piece, because that's the one of the clips that's gone really viral. Horse dewormers, not a flattering thing, I get it's that. It's a lie. It's a lie on a news network. It, it, and as you said, it's it, it's not entire, Rogan's framed it as a lie. So basically he, he challenged Gupta on CNN saying that he'd taken horse dewormer. And I, all, all through this, so ivermectin something I started kind of looking into a couple of months ago, um, maybe more, maybe like three months ago now. And I remember when that horse dewormer story sort of took off and it was, I, I, I tweeted out quite a bit at the time, this is a really stupid, this is a really stupid thing to be saying by basically saying everyone's taking horse dewormer, ha ha ha. It was just more of the same sneering at, kind of mainstream sneering at stupid rubes kind of language that people hate for, for good reason, because it's, it's, demeaning, it's judgmental, it's like everything people hate about the media. And it wasn't true, or it wasn't the whole story. It is, it is true that people were buying veterinary ivermectin because they couldn't get the, the uh, kind of human version. Vet stores in all around the country had, been, had sold out of veterinary ivermectin, so it is true that people were taking it. It's not true that that uh, Joe Rogan was taking it. He he had a kind of he was prescribed some. 
but at the same time, so it's not it's not a hundred percent wrong, but it's also not true that that Joe Rogan was taking the horse dewormer ivermectin. Um, and the fascinating thing about the ivermectin story, and he talked he he re referred to Uttar Pradesh. He talked a little bit about um, Pierre Corey, and I didn't think that. Gupta knew all that much about ivermectin. Like he did, he he hinted at a few things, but he didn't seem to know very much about it. And it was really interesting. Ivermectin is a perfect case study of you never see the whole story being told. Almost everyone is telling a part of the story on either side. The Uttar Pradesh thing being a perfect example. Um, the fact that Uttar Pradesh for people who may not be familiar with it, the, it's, it's now by ivermectin advocates, it's basically, they say, well, look at Uttar Pradesh. It was, they started taking ivermectin or they, they were issuing ivermectin uh, and it basically crushed COVID. It, it, it destroyed the transmission and the COVID cases went down. There's a lot more to that story than, is being, than was being reported. And the fact that they're kind of returning to that, I find fascinating because the actual story is that the evidence base for ivermectin has been crumbling quite quickly. A lot of the meta-analyses that were done, the original, and it's fascinating to watch like the position on ivermectin, whether or not it will still be proven to have some benefit, and pretty much everyone I've spoken to is open-minded on that. They think the most likely thing is that it may be proved to have some benefit, but the initial, the way it was framed at the beginning that this could just this could end the pandemic tomorrow it's 100 percent successful at preventing transmission that is clearly no longer true and not and no one's really saying that the study that that was based on the 100 percent which i think rogan should be interested in because he hosted pierre corey who was relying on that study the car value study quite extensively in the podcast they did together with brett weinstein to make the case that it could be 100% effective. And that's what, that's what drove a lot of the, the, the use of ivermectin. It was people taking it as a prevention, not necessarily people taking it as a, for when they got COVID. So maybe, maybe I've talked for quite a while. I've got more to say about the, the Utah Pradesh and the, the ivermectin story, but um, I don't want to talk over you for, for too long. No, you know, I think you're one of the world experts on ivermectin now, actually, David. <laughs> Seriously, the amount of work you've put in and the diligence, like, you know, the, the message that I would get from you asking questions and who to ask and your your passion about finding truth is actually really unusual in the world these days. So I have to say this about ivermectin. And, and again, you could talk about this for hours, Uttar Pradesh, all this. What I find frustrating in on all sides of this, because the pharmaceutical side does this, they rely on poor biased data to say this thing is this effective and you should take it and so on. And then you actually do a good trial or you look at post-marketing surveillance and you go, this doesn't do shit or it actually causes harm. With ivermectin, it's a very similar set of fallacies and biases and misunderstanding of how to interpret data that, that seems to be happening. So you have a lot of observational data and remembering that causation, uh, uh, the the drug actually doing something versus being correlated with doing something are very different things. And so you really need to dig into that. And the way you really tease that out is you do randomized control trials. Now, Corey and others have said, well, we don't have time for this. We have to dive in and just give this stuff. It's like, that's not, that's not okay. And some will say, no, it is okay, it's a pandemic, it's an emergency. Okay, then why is it not okay to have an emergency use authorization for a, vaccine that's been studied in randomized control trials, which is our gold standard, right? Actually, a gold standard is a meta-analysis of randomized control trials. So a, 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 collab, a consolidation of all the best data in a metadata, right? A meta-analysis of garbage trials, which is what the ivermectin meta-analysis was, is not the gold standard of data. And that's another misrepresentation that Corey puts out there. So you you need to recognize, I think there is an innate bias towards ivermectin because it is the flag holder for a, a heterodox opinion. Whether you're reluctant about vaccines, you don't like big pharma, even though Merck made ivermectin, but no, they can't make money on it. So now they're making molnupiravir, which is their, you know, the, the heterodox position is, oh, that's ivermectin with Sorry, the, I'm going to call it the the false heterodox position. Is it's it's ivermectin? The contrarian, contrarian 
Ah, that's better. Yeah, it's a, it's, it, let's not even put heterodox in there because it's not heterodox, it's contrarian, yeah. Uh, it, you know, this is, this is a profitable ivermectin for them, right? Uh, because they've, they can patent it and they can do this and that and the other thing. All right, um, molnupiravir, we haven't seen the primary data, but that was a randomized control trial with lots of people, international, with def, predefined endpoints, pre-registered trial. And it looks pretty good if given early. It doesn't work after you're already sick. You have to give it early. And so I think that it's very reasonable to explore ivermectin, to look at that, that data, but to, to, the way that it's presented by Rogan and others is so anti-scientific that it becomes very frustrating for people who work in this space. And, and that's why, you know, Vinay Prasad, who is a, he's the biggest critic of pharma you will ever find. He's written books about this. He's a big critic of the medical industry. And he's made it his career at UCSF. This is what he studies is medical reversal. When we find out something we were doing was total BS. He looks at the ivermectin data and goes, yeah, this is an example of everything, how not to do science. The, you know, you need good randomized trials. And the important point there is with any therapeutic, with any medicine, the pre-test probability, in other words, just the advanced probability of it working is vanishingly small. If you look at the entire history of therapeutics, Whereas vaccines have a better track record because, and, and this is a distinction that I think is important. Vaccines use the human body in a way that therapeutics don't. Therapeutics try to bypass or put a, a something in the widget of how our natural body works. In many cases, not always, right? What vaccines do is they go, okay, human body, billions of years of evolution has this immune system that does this thing let's teach the immune system to do its thing against this certain thing. Now you can get it wrong and you can have side effects of vaccines, absolutely. But it's a much more sort of holistic way of treating actually. It's much more natural in a way, but people don't really see it that way because again, I, don't, I think nature has a better PR agent than vaccines do. <laughs> but yeah, so I don't know where I was going with all this, but that ivermectin thing is the great flag bearer for distorted thought, emotional reasoning, um, just as much as it, they're guilty of it on the other side. And like you said, that condescending language, like, oh, they're, you know, these hicks are having horse dewormer and, you know, what's wrong with them? That is poisonous. It's also poisonous to a drug that saved hundreds of millions of lives from parasites around the world. Like it's, it's, it's demeaning to that accomplishment. It's a human accomplishment, right? Hmm. Yeah, and I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper into the ivermectin thing. <laughs> having, having unfortunately dived far too deeply, more than any one person should do. I mean, what was great is that Rogan said, oh, it'd be great to see to have Corey, I think he initially suggested that he had Vinay, uh, sorry, yeah, Vinay Gupta in conversation, Sanjay Gupta, sorry, in conversation with, um, with Corey, which would be great. I'd love to see Corey in de debate with somebody or dialogue with somebody about it. But the fascinating thing for me has been just watching the conversation and the arguments change around ivermectin. Whatever you think about whether it may still be proven to work, the narrative at the beginning was this is overwhelmingly proved. The only reason that people might have for saying that it isn't is uh, big pharma corruption. And they look, talked about meta studies, they talked about all of these different kind of levels of evidence. And as those have changed, very few people have changed their positions. The arguments have changed, but the positions haven't. With a few outliers, it's interesting, Eric Osgood, who yeah. was, was initially very pro-ivermectin, is still pro-ivermectin, still believes that it might have some effect, but he doesn't believe it now works as a prophylactic against COVID, against Delta, he's now decided. He also thinks that it's probably most likely that it will have a, a minor benefit rather than a major benefit. He has shifted. Andrew Hill of the University of Liverpool, who was initially pro-ivermectin from his, uh, the meta-analysis he put together, when some of these studies were withdrawn, he said, okay, this is no longer proved, and he withdrew. But the people who've established their very public positions haven't budged, but the arguments have budged. And so you've ended up like someone like, like Pierre Corey, and the fascinating thing when I spoke to a lot of medical people who knew Corey's team and worked with Corey's team, were aware of how things had changed and 
Eric Osgood being one of them. And Eric, we put out a film with Eric where he talked about how he saw Corey change, particularly when he, when he went in front of the Senate and the Senate was sort of playing political games and he felt, and were disrespecting him basically. He said he saw him get more and more kind of aligned, more and more sort of um, fixated and more certain in his language and much more kind of evangelical. And a lot of other people who work with Corey also said, yeah, we saw him change. We saw him become much, much more certain. And I, I put that into my piece. I, I sort of said, okay, this is what I've heard. And I don't know whether that, some people would say, okay, that's ad hominem. And I don't know. I don't know if that's the right thing to do. But for me, it's sort of like, this is how we have to, this is sense making for me. Like we have to look at people's emotional motivations, which we're detecting anyway. We're picking up people's emotional motivations. We're sensing that. We're seeing how uh, people challenge, people are challenged and how they, how they react to those challenges. So I think I was trying to make it sort of more conscious by bringing it into the uh, conversation. Okay, I have to say something here. That is such an important piece of this. You're a counselor, right, David? Like you, yeah. How do I say this? Because I don't want to get this wrong. I think it's so important. Because I said earlier, oh, I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, you know, um, get into the mind reading fallacy with Joe Rogan and try to get in his head and this and that. But but honestly, you said something very important. We detect these emotional states in people. And so humans are amazing BS detectors and the way that we get around, the way we fool other humans evolutionarily, I think, is we learn to fool ourselves. So if we can self-deceive, then our expressions are honest expressions because we've actually deceived ourselves. When you talk about Pierre Corey, when you talk about his colleague, Paul Merrick, who I've met, who is a lovely human being. He's been on my show talking about his vitamin C sepsis protocol. He's one of the big FLCCC ivermectin guys. When the randomized trials came out showing that his Merrick cocktail didn't work, he was really upset. He felt it was a personal attack that all the studies were designed to fail and so on. And he entrenched and I could feel it. I could feel it clearly happening, but how do you say that, right? And with Corey, it's the same thing. What I detected in him when I saw him on Rogan the first time is, oh, here's a guy who's self-deceiving himself about this. And the way he's projecting it, it's so certain, no doctor should ever speak like he's speaking. And I could feel it. And I said something on my show, I'm like, man, my spider sense is just tingling. And, and what does that mean? So how do you, because there's a mind reading fallacy, you cannot know how he's feeling. At the same time, you use the tools that humans have to have a theory of mind and a theory of, okay, what's going on? I think with the ivermectin thing, the moving goalposts that you talk about where people are like, okay, that that's no longer looking good. Oh, the big randomized trial we were relying on turns out to have been fraudulent and plagiarized. Okay, the meta-analysis is falling apart, but look at Uttar Pradesh. Oh. And then the argument against that, of course, is manifold that, <laughs> you know, the Delta dynamics do this. You know, there's, there's a lot of things you can talk about, but they, they just keep moving goalposts because you're not defending truth. You're defending something that feels more real than truth to you, which is this core of identity that now is accrued around it. Being attacked as a human being is so painful, your beliefs especially, that you will do whatever you can to defend. And that's why Rogan got, now again, I'm, now I'm speculating. Let me just pretend, let me speculate for a second. Rogan got really pissed about CNN mischaracterizing the ivermectin thing, you know, and he called it lies, they're lying about me. Do you condone CNN lying, Sanjay? Aren't you their medical correspondent? Aren't you supposed to be talking to them? And Sanjay did something that I didn't think was very, he just kind of crumbled in the face of that. It was like, well, maybe I should, I don't know, they're good people, I don't, you know, he's the wrong person to go necessarily head to head in a debate with Rogan, but he's probably a good person to have a dialogue, right? So in any case, I think this is a key thing, David, and I think the fact that you pointed out is important. And I think if we, we're we not able to bring that to the conversation, we're missing the fact that most of human behavior is based on this and a little bit on this. So it's important. I don't know how to formalize it, but you know, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, that's, it's a conversation that I think needs to be had. 
Because the other side of that, like you mentioned, it's very difficult for us to, to back away from public positions we've had. What I've realized is that this is a problem that we all face now because all, so many of our thoughts are now public. We're all doing this on social media. We're now, I've got this sense that we crystallize around our worst ideas because we put those out onto Twitter or we put those out onto Facebook and they're then public. We have to defend them. We go through this process really aligning with them. And so we all start to kind of crystallize around these positions. And that's what these social media platforms are designed to do. They're working on our narcissism. They're working on our performativity. They're working on all of these kind of issues. And those same forces that happen to all of us who use these platforms, I think are massively accelerated with content creators. Anyone who's on, on YouTube, who then feels the kind of siren call of the comments thread or the Patreon. I mean, once you've established a certain position that is then being monetarily rewarded, and you're going to attract some of the most extreme people to whatever position you have, it's then very difficult to back away from that. There's all of these psychological reasons and we're overwhelmed with all of this input and it's very easy for us then if we're getting like, more, we're, we're super saturated with input with more than we can ever absorb, it's very easy for us then to just let in the bits that support our position and, and screen out the ones that don't. And I think the, the, the fact that all of these things that uh, Tristan Harris talks about in The Social Dilemma that affect all of us, I think are massively accelerated with content creators. I've kind of talked about it, the, the intellectual dark web, that whole, that whole kind of movement. I think that a lot of them got captured by their audience. And, and that seems to be a sort of factor that, and what I, it was interesting because Rogan actually kind of nodded to that in his introduction to, to Sanjay Gupta because he said, why I like you is because you publicly changed your mind about yeah. marijuana. Which I, which I really liked. I liked that about Rogan, that that's what he was looking for in Sanjay Gupta and was like, yeah, I, I trust you because you've publicly changed your mind about something important. And I was like, ah, oh, that's, that's a really good metric. That's a really good metric for Rogan to be using. And he kind of went up in my estimation when I heard that. Yeah, no, I, <clears throat> I thought that was great. I thought the way he started and ended that show, that was, that was so alt-middle. So he says, hey, I'm, I respect you because you changed your mind on this. Now I push back a little and say, you know, Gupta coming out for marijuana at the time he did was not a very brave or, or heterodox thing to do, but because he's so mainstream, it was. Because he was with CNN, it was. Um, but the, they ended it by saying, Gupta said, you know, Joe, I, I like the way you think. And not what you think about, not what you believe, I like the way you think. And Rogan said, I like the way you think. And I thought that was really, really, really good because then it, it establishes this, oh, hey, we're having a dialogue. I respect your thought process. I may disagree, but you're, you're clearly not acting in bad faith. And uh, this was a conversation worth having. I feel better for having had it. Th that's phenomenal. Um, it, it, it really is. And um, you know, audience capture that you had mentioned, so, it, it's funny because even when we did our we did that show a while back uh, for Rebel Wisdom, man, I was reading those comments. I was like, "Damn, these people do not like me." <laughs> and it's a kind of it's 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 kind of awesome to be able to go in a place where the innate bias is against whatever you're saying, or maybe even against you as your personality or whatever it is. Right? There's an there, it ought to exhilarate you. It ought to make you feel like, okay, I'm awake now. This is great. Um, we're so conditioned financially by our audience. Like, I mean, I have capture in the sense that I've got 10,000 people who subscribe, who pay to subscribe to my show in our supporter group and we have conversations. But if you ask them what we talk about, man, I say stuff that pisses them off a lot. It's kind of like this, this almost like familiar around the dinner table, crazy uncle kind of conversations and some of them will leave, some of them will angrily leave, but in general, they're like, hey, this is why I'm here. You know, We're here to be us and authentically be us. But there is a capture. Like if I were to get um, you know, someone like Robert F. Kennedy, like a major anti-vax guy on my show, which I wouldn't do because I just don't think he's qualified to talk about vaccines, he's a lawyer. But that being said, if I did, oh, I, I, believe me, my audience, that would be the end of, of the thing. So, 
there's this there's this it, there's a psychological component and you're right in the creator world it is accelerated everything Tristan talks about is accelerated um we also have you know you sent me that great piece in the stoa about this sort of uh, culture wars 2.0 this idea that we've all siloed off into our little sub mimetic tribes and the goal is to basically it's in group out group against the other tribes and you know it's it's really about uh, 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 creating that and maintaining that tribe. It's not about transcending or including the other tribes. And that's something that we really have to look at, you know, quite carefully. Yeah. I wanted to kind of bookend the, the conversation about ivermectin, just, just with that sense of like, why and where is only half the story being told? So you've got the sense at the moment, like a lot of the, the trials um, have been withdrawn, like I think around now 20% have found to have been kind of serious fraud. And it's fascinating that the Utah Pradesh example is the one that people now keep coming back to, even though it's relatively old news. Because if you, if you actually dig into it, and I was having a look today, I was kind of looking at some articles online and there's not, it's not been reported that much. There's a few kind of pro and there's a few kind of anti articles and there's very rarely, like that's what I mean, like the whole story is not being told. For example, I had a look at a few of the kind of Uttar Pradesh success story, and the argument is that Uttar Pradesh stopped COVID with ivermectin despite only 11% of the population being vaccinated. Like that's the headline, which sounds very compelling. And then it's, they compare it to Kerala, where a higher proportion of the people were vaccinated and they've still got a lot of cases. But what none of them say, none of these articles say, is that tests done in about July 2021 showed that around 70%, 71% of people in Uttar Pradesh had antibodies, had already got COVID. Like Delta had ripped through Uttar Pradesh and 71%, so effectively that's a 71% vaccination rate. Or 71% plus 11%, that's, that's a high enough vaccination rate to stop the spread. And Uttar Pradesh, it doesn't add up on so many levels. Like, you've got to think about what would be required. I had a conversation with someone, a very intelligent guy, a few days ago, where he was saying, oh, I was convinced by Uttar Pradesh, and I kind of pushed back a little bit, and I said, this is why that doesn't add up. And he said, oh, is that... Um, I, I thought this was a story about it being used to treat. And I was like, no, no, the whole point is that this is an argument used about prophylaxis. And he'd, he'd conflated the two things. So you've got to think about what it would be require for prophylaxis. And for prophylaxis, you'd have to distribute it at huge levels, make sure you had a lot of, basically everyone was taking it who was close to anyone who, who had COVID. And then you look at where this story came from. The story wasn't even generated really from that much within India. It was like there was a pack that was sent out to lots of people that contained ivermectin and it sort of surfaced a bit later on that, oh, it contains ivermectin, that must be the reason. Like the whole thing falls apart very, very quickly. And you're just like, why in all of these stories, and it's been all over the kind of, in particular, the right wing press about Uttar Pradesh as this success story, why in none of those is this piece of verifiable information that 71% of people had contracted and recovered from COVID and had antibodies by the time you saw the, the numbers start to drop. Like that's, yeah, the, the, the information warfare over this and the way that the, and it's fascinating. I've seen this on Twitter quite a lot. Like I've obviously been engaged in quite a lot of ivermectin conversations and someone will come in and go, what about, Iver, what about Uttar Pradesh? What about India? And you're like, this is the lowest form of evidence generally, because you're mixing correlation, you don't know whether there were lockdowns, you don't know whether there were other, other factors, but people are just looking for anything that will, that will follow a certain narrative. And ivermectin has become this totemic thing. And it's, it's the nearest thing I've ever seen in my life to, well, apart from QAnon, but it's one of the nearest things to a cult I've seen in my lifetime. And it's so bizarre. It just shows what's, what's wonderful about it in a way is it just shows we are so starved for meaning and religious meaning in in general that we can turn a religion into it we can turn anything into a religion like ivermectin has become a religion it's it's 
and there's a deep sort of religious, spiritual perspective there. It's like if we remove the sacred from our lives, we remove religion from our lives, we will replace that kind of level of passion and certainty or we'll replace anything with it. Even an even a anti-parasitic drug can become the new sacrament. And it's like, wow, it's religious thinking. It's so fascinating. It's, it's, it's wonderful to see in many ways. My God, you go into a church and it's just uh, uh, a little tab of ivermectin on the tongue. This is my blood you drink. I mean, I think you nailed it, dude, <clears throat> because it has the fervor of religious zeal. Hydro hydroxychloroquine had the same thing. It's a badge of tribal identity. And you're right, in the, in the absence of a, a, a religious center, we we look for meaning. Is meaning in our tribe? Is meaning in horse dewormer? Is meaning in you know uh, 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 not wearing a mask? Is meaning in wearing a mask? And and then you find people that are like you, and then you get the dopamine rush of the agreement of yeah. Can you believe how stupid these people are? They're taking horse dewormer. These guys are wearing masks. What idiots they are! They're they're getting sick from the masks and. Uh, honestly, I mean, <laughs> it, it, it is. It's like we've sucked the 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 meaning out of society. We've tribalized us. We've then weaponized everything with social media. Then you have state actors. It's everything that Peter and the guys at Stoa write about in the Culture Wars 2.0. It, it is exact. I think is quite prophetic that that's what it is. And the question is then, how do we start to defragment that hard drive and synthesize it? In a way, I think the first, you know, it's like, I don't know if Daniel Schmachtenberger or somebody said that like that the key to solving problem is just to, to state them clearly, like really state them clearly. Um, a lot of times I get criticized for saying, oh, these are all the problems, but what are your solutions? I'm like, well, my solution is to state the problems correctly, like as clearly as possible. Here's what's wrong. So now we understand, now we can emerge a solution that maybe we can't even see yet, but if we understand the problem, we can emerge the solution. So for this, I, I'd love to see, you know, what is that sense making, that S space where you synthesize, you are also aware of your own biases. I think that component you mentioned before about the psychological underpinning of this, if we don't understand ourselves, you know, Nisargadatta, the Indian sage said this, he's like, forget about reforms, mind the reformer. Like it, you create the world until you actually understand your own, um, <clears throat> reactants, you're not gonna you're not gonna manifest in the world anything that that is different than you. So, I think that's going to be really important increasingly uh, going forward. Hmm. And moving on a little bit to like vaccine, um, some of the maybe some of the conversations that were held on on Rogan. Um, what did you agree with him on, or what did you agree with him? What did you agree with 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 Gupta on in that? interview. Yeah. So let's see. I, I, The kid's myocarditis piece I thought was interesting. Now, Rogan was citing a study with Tracy Beth Hogue, who's fantastic, but it's a preprint. And actually it's gotten a lot of attention since he cited it. And Tracy actually tweeted <clears throat> this morning saying, okay, we're actually revising some of the stuff or, you know, based on feedback and so on. The main thing with that is they they said, okay, here's the risk of myocarditis, which in about 84% of kids ends up, puts you in the hospital, but it's typically reversible. But man, you, do you really want your kid in the hospital, right? Compared to the risk Sorry, in the let's, next- Let's time. go back, because you said 84% of kids, you might, some people might be saying 84% of kids who take the vaccine. What you mean is 84% of kids who get myocarditis- Myocarditis. That's right, very important distinction. So 84% of kids who get vaccine-induced myocarditis end up hospitalized. And this is based on some data sets. But they then said, well, what's your risk of getting hospitalized with COVID for those kids? And that's what Rogan pointed out is because we you know you're much more likely to get hospitalized from vaccine induced myocarditis than you are from COVID if you're a young boy. Well, it's a little misleading because the they're talking about a time frame of only a few months. So what's your risk of being hospitalized with COVID in the next couple months versus your risk of vaccine-induced myocarditis hospitalizing you. That's not necessarily the clearest comparison. You have to say, well, over the course of the pandemic or the time you would ever get COVID, because there is some data saying, well, if you get COVID, your risk of myocarditis is quite a bit higher. So I think a nuanced conversation around that. Now, see, this is the thing though. I love 
that Rogan was just really, and it felt like Gupta really didn't understand what he was saying because what, he, okay, let's say he took an incomplete data set and was spinning it in a certain way based on his bias. But his question is valid, which is, well, Sanjay, you're a 51 year old dude who's double vaccinated. Your risk of being hospitalized with COVID is the same as a 10 year old who's unvaccinated. You're comfortable coming on my show, walking around the world, doing your thing. Why should a parent not be comfortable with their 10 year old doing the same thing? I thought that was brilliant. And Gupta was kind of like, oh, wait, you're, so you're saying I need to be boosted? He didn't quite understand. When he did figure it out, he said, well, there's a communitarian effect of vaccinating children. They're less likely to spread it. Rogan pushed back and said, no, but it says vaccines can spread too. But less, Joe, because your eightfold risk of uh, being infected is less. You're infectious for less, according to Korean data. So you are actually gonna bend the transmission curve by vaccinating people who are at themselves low risk, but could be transmission agents. And there's nuance in that, how much do kids transmit and so on. So those are the questions we ought to be asking. And I thought it was interesting. People really seized on that. They're like, well, Gupta couldn't answer the question. It's like, I think he was a little bit, again, this is why like Paul Offit would have been like, well, Joe, here's, here's the data. Here's what I think about this. And he would have been quite firm because this is what he does, right? Um, but, um, that, that was the myocarditis piece. Um, you know, any other thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of focus on natural immunity versus vaccines as well, which is something that I think you've talked about before, that if we reframed the idea of vaccine passports against immunity passports, there might be a little bit more openness. And I guess this is sort of the... This is where we're talking about sort of the heterodox versus mainstream view, like the mainstream kind of vaccine maximalist view is what I think a lot of people are pushing back on. Um, and the heterodox view for me is, yeah, there, there is a question to be asked about natural immunity versus, there was the, the famous, I don't know if you saw the, the Project Veritas stuff that came out recently with the Pfizer scientists basically saying, yeah, well, natural immunity is probably better than the vaccine. And um, there's a bit of controversy over the data there, but there's certainly a case to be made for immunity. Yeah, talking about immunity as a whole rather than just vaccine, because I think people then react to the fact like you're you're basically telling me to get a vaccine and it's an imposition. Like by, by definition, you're asking someone to, to take something that they may not want to do. And that's that's where I think where people are reacting to it, I think. Can, can I, uh, let me rant for a second about this because this is something that really pisses me off and uh my community of physicians and, and thinkers like this, it, it's disgusting that this is the mainstream attitude that natural immunity isn't a thing. People are actually belittled for having natural immunity. Again, it's this condescending thing. So what does that do? It drives rational thinkers who also have some emotional bias towards, yeah, I don't, I don't really wanna get vaccinated because my friend got vaccinated. He got a lot of symptoms that next day. He's out of work for a day. And look, I've already been through that shit. I got COVID, I paid my dues. And the data here from Israel says I'm actually more immune. And you know, this small Kentucky study and so on. And look, you can cherry pick whatever data to support whatever you want. The bottom line is if naturally getting infected with COVID didn't generate immunity, then it's very unlikely that the vaccine would generate immunity. Paul Offit came on my show and basically said, look, I had measles naturally. They were trying to get me to get a measles vaccine. I was like, hell no, I'm sterile. I have sterilizing immunity. So it's like, well, I said, Paul, you know, that's the argument for, and Paul agreed. He's like, no, natural immunity is real. Natural immunity plus one dose of the vaccine is even better. But I think that compelling people to do that, it generates a degree of rational mistrust of the authorities. It's like, well, you don't even understand the science yourself, Ace. Why are you telling me to do this? So I thought when, you know, when Joe talks about natural immunity, I thought it was good. He's a little misguided because, you know, he he's really again, and his biases, look, he's in the he's in the MMA space, he takes shit ton of vitamins, supplements, all this other stuff, and really believes in that. Like it's an ideology. Talk about a like religious fervor. Like nutrition is a religious fervor and Joe defends it as a religion almost, it, you know, cause the data on it, it's very hard to do nutritional trials. It really is. And most of the real randomized data on vitamins show that they're neutral at best, harmful at, at worst when you take them as supplements, when you don't have a deficiency. So all that being said, you know, this, this, um, 
kind of idea of natural immunity, when Joe brings it up, he says, well, you know what I think is go get, and, and he said that I thought it was actually kind of fun. He says, hey, Sanja, Sanjay, you, you've been vaccinated. Go get naturally infected now. That'll be your booster and you'll have super immunity. And you know what? He's not wrong. It's probably true, but where the nuance is, is well, now Sanjay is infected with COVID. He can actually spread the disease for a narrow window. There is a possibility he'll be a rare breakthrough, breakthrough case where he gets actually quite sick. So there's nuance and that's the nuance you wanna you know, discuss when you're thinking about these things, but it's not an and or. And na the natural immunity thing has been a shit show. It never should have been treated this way. And Paul even said on the show, he's a member of the FDA advisory committee. He said, you know, the reason that CDC said you just got to get vaccinated is because it's a logistic nightmare to prove that someone's been naturally immune. It's like, well, it was worth investing in the logistics for that. All right. To, to, to actually increase overall trust in our government and their public health policy, because right now I don't trust them. Mm. Yeah, this is one of the good examples of the 80-20 because that's what you hear a lot of the time um, on the Dark Horse, from Rogan, from like, that's a heterodox perspective, like it's counter mainstream, but it's also shared by a lot of doctors. And I think people don't quite realize that it's shared by a lot of doctors. They feel like all the doctors are in lockstep with, no, you must get vaccinated, natural immunity is not a thing. And that's that's not true. Like there's like, as you, as you said, like Paul Offit is about as kind of thesis, COVID thesis as they come, but there's still a good amount of kind of debate around that. Um, and also like the question of boosters, I think is another interesting area where the narrative on the contrarian side for a long time has been, well, you can't trust the FDA. The FDA are clearly just there to rubber stamp whatever the, the pharma companies want. And then the FDA basically opposes boosters. The FDA says, no, there's no good, there's no good case for it. The case for vaccines has always been that they prevent you from getting, uh, effectively the, the, the vaccine uh, protection from spreading it is waning, but there's still very good protection against going to hospital, dying from the, from the disease. So therefore we don't think the boost has been proven. And then there's a conflict with the White House, et cetera, et cetera. But the interesting thing for me is like, that shows that at least the FDA on certain topics can act independent of political pressure, which they had huge amounts of, and big pharma pressure. So this kind of idea that there's this sort of institutional egregore, for want of a better word, is clearly disproved by that, even though there's now a kind of big controversy over, well, the White House seems to be wanting to push that through anyway. Um, yeah, what's your view on boosters and what did you make of that disagreement? Yeah, no, that's a very good point. I, okay, so <clears throat> I had Paul on the show. He's on that FDA advisory committee that made that original vote on the Pfizer booster. And he went on a rant about boosters. He basically said, listen, there's a distinction between a third dose and a booster. And here's how it goes. A third dose means you need three doses of this vaccine to generate the memory B and T cells that generate durable immunity against severe disease. It turns out with mRNA vaccines, you don't need a third dose. The two doses, even spaced close together as they are, there's something about the mRNA vaccines, they're more immunogenic. Or, or another theory is this virus is so novel to humans. Humans have never really seen this virus that, and that's part of the reason why when you get the vaccine and you've not been exposed or whatever, or the second dose, it's like, it's such a new thing that once the immune system's primed, you have a big response because it's like, okay, we gotta do something. This is a new, brand new novel threat. Um, because of that, for whatever reason, you generate really strong memory B and T cells. Your antibody levels, which are neutralizing antibodies, they decline over time as they're going to do. So as you said, you can get reinfected, but that, that, that virus getting in your bloodstream, as you spin up your memory response, you're not gonna get that sick. And that's the idea here. So you don't need three doses. Now, what's a booster? A booster is a different concept. A booster says those neutralizing antibodies that drop, we wanna boost them back up so that we have protection against even infection, closer to the levels we had in the beginning of vaccination with alpha where you know the vaccines hadn't, the neutralizing antibodies hadn't waned. And so you're reducing a breakthrough infection of any kind and reducing transmission. Now, what Paul said is, but so why? Like, do we really care? The goal should be get everybody that first dose or doses so that you have enough combination of natural immunity, vaccine generated immunity that 
we're not worried about severe disease and this thing becomes a cold. I don't care if I get a cold. I don't wanna take a vaccine to prevent a cold because the downside of the vaccine is, you know, you could be out for a day with fevers and rigors and it sucked. My second dose of Moderna sucked. It was brutal. And when you really think about that, you're asking people to suffer. You're asking people to take off work for a benefit that's like, wait, what's the benefit? for a booster, right? And, um, you know, my wife got the booster. She's at Stanford. She's a radiologist at Stanford. And she's like, I don't even want to get a breakthrough infection because they're going to quarantine me for seven days. I'll be out of work. It'll be a mess. So I'm going to go get the booster. She gets the booster for Pfizer. For a day, she's just hit by a train. So there is the even the, the downside of that. So when they talk when they talk about boosters, I think it's crucial to understand FDA said, no, not for everybody. And then CDC kind of overrode and said, no, let's let uh, anyone who's in a job that has frontline exposure, let's approve a booster for them. Now, look, I think that should be an option. Anyone who wants a booster, if they don't even want to get infected, sure, that should be an option. And I think that approval allows for that, but it also opens the door for mandated boosters in the, it, like say in the US, like they're doing in Israel. That's, it just doesn't seem very scientific in the sense that this is something that's up for debate. And a lot of doctors, again, Paul Offit, who is the thesis, is very heterodox on boosters. He's very heterodox on natural immunity. And I think that's that's very important to, 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 to look at. Hmm. And what do you think of the vaccine mandates that they've introduced in the US? So, okay, th so this is where, again, like my own tribe hates me. Um, but this is where, this is where, okay, I did a piece saying vaccine mandates, these federal vaccine mandates are horrible and here's why. And the reason is, um, first of all, historically we've had mandates for vaccines. We've had mandates for seatbelts. They don't work in a year. They work over multiple years. We're trying to make them work for an immediate pandemic and they may not do that. So your benefit may be small because the number of people who fall under the mandate who are unvaccinated, who are gonna actually prevent severe disease in, who are at risk, that's a, not a high number. But what's the downside? You're generating something called emotional reactance. So people who do not like being told what to do by a government they don't trust are going to go, wait, what? And they're gonna try then to find validation of their feelings by going online, finding Robert Malone or you know, Steve Kirsch or whoever these guys are and say, oh, look what this smart guy's saying about this. No, I'm not getting any vaccine. And in fact, I'm gonna tell all my friends not to get the vaccine and my family and my parents not to get the vaccine because this is BS. And so the reason I think this is true is when I did that piece where I really aligned with the more libertarian viewpoint, which is educate people, I'm telling you, go. I think you should get vaccinated, almost assuredly, right? But I think that should be your choice. Well, because again, with COVID, if you're vaccinated, you're generally protected against severe disease, even from unvaccinated people. Uh, but you know, I think these mandates are terrible. I got about a billion emails from people who were like, you know what, I. I was so angry when Biden mandated this thing that I wanted to just basically march on the Capitol. I was never gonna get vaccinated. Then you came out and said, you know what? I'm a doctor. I agree with what you feel, but here's why you should still get vaccinated. And so I'm gonna, buy, I'm gonna hold my nose and go get this vaccine, right? And I was like, okay, that, that's a conversation, right? Overcoming the emotional reactance by acknowledging that it's even there. So that's why I don't like mandates. And in healthcare, the mandates are even more draconian. Here were our healthcare heroes, which Rogan brought up. I was so glad. I was like, Rogan, Rogan. That's where I felt a tribal identity. I said, yes, because he said, all these healthcare heroes that they were taking care of COVID people, now you're mandating they get a vaccine even though they were naturally infected and or they're gonna be fired. You're gonna, they're gonna lose their job. How does that, you know, how does that feel, Sanjay? And he was like, wah, 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 wah. you know, I, I thought that was great. I thought Rogan did a good job on pushing on that. Yeah, and I remember I saw your piece about the vaccine passports, and I think you used Jonathan Haidt's ideas of sort of moral, the moral taste buds effectively to explain people's attitude to it. I don't know if you could sort of summarize that, because I think it's a really useful frame. Yeah, you know, I, I really like the way Haidt breaks down the fact that everyone is trying to be good using the moral taste buds they have. We all have these moral flavors, but we value them in different ways. Kind of like you may like sweet a little more than savory. So the taste buds in general are liberty versus oppression. So that sort of spectrum, uh, care versus harm, um, uh, fairness versus cheating, um, 
authority versus betrayal, uh, loyalty versus subversion, kind of a similar piece of that, sanctity versus degradation. So let's, let's think about vaccine passports. How you see this depends on what your moral taste buds are. So if liberty versus oppression is a major taste bud of you and you like liberty, vaccine passport feels like show me your papers. It feels like an imposition of the government on your body. Now that bleeds into the sanctity versus degradation taste bud, which says you're gonna inject something that I don't understand into my body, which is a temple. You're gonna degrade the sanctity of my body. That's another taste bud, right? Now, if you're, if you're on the other side of that debate, vaccine passport pro, you might have the taste buds that say care versus harm. We need to save as many lives as we can. And the more people that get vaccinated, the better. Fairness versus cheating. Why is that guy not vaccinated making everyone sick when, you know, so on and so forth. Loyalty versus, you know, uh, betrayal. Like I'm loyal to the community and not just to myself, but you may not feel the liberty versus oppression or the sanctity versus degradation type of piece, or you may feel it differently. Sanctity versus degradation may feel like, I don't want this unvaccinated person near my kids who can't be vaccinated. So the vaccine passport polarizes in that way based on moral palate. But if you recognize that, you can speak the language of all of those moral palates in a reasoned way to come to some synthesis that may be right for that person, but it, it, you have to recognize it first. Yeah, it's fascinating being in the UK. I, I was in Berlin uh, recently last weekend and you need to have proof of vaccination to be served in a bar. I've got a friend in Canada who couldn't celebrate his anniversary because he wasn't vaccinated um, and couldn't book a restaurant. And in the UK, I think we've, I, I know, so I, w I went to Mexico kind of earlier this year and there were armed police basically kind of making sure that you wore masks in public. And I felt very, very, I think I'd feel very, very differently about the kind of, um, about COVID and about the pandemic if I didn't live in the UK, where basically I think we've got generally common sense rules about most of these things. There's no, res there's no restrictions now anywhere in terms of needing, vac needing kind of vaccine proof to go anywhere. Like restaurants are open, bars are open. They're sort of basically, the attitude seems to be we gave you all a chance to get vaccinated. If you didn't get vaccinated, now the risk is on you and you might as well kind of open up. And, and I know how I felt in Mexico when I was basically made to do something that was stupid. We were outdoors in the heat wearing a mask. Like if, if it had felt like that in the UK from the beginning, I would have felt very, very different about it. But in London, for example, you wear, you, we were wearing masks in shops as a kind of like, which, which seems like a natural thing to do. There's, some people are freaking out, it sort of feels polite, but no expectation to wear them in the streets. And I feel, so I, I certainly register on that. I really don't like being told what to do. Like that's a, that's a major factor for me. And so the, the vaccine passport thing is like, my instinctive reaction is no. Like, and I've always sort of, when people have said, well, should I get vaccinated? You've looked into this a lot. I said, well, it's up to you, but this is what I found while investigating, I just want people to make their judgments based on the, the best data available. And I found that this particular claim, this particular claim don't add up. And so I'll, I'll put that out there. As a journalist, I feel that I've got an obligation to say what I believe to be true. But then the sort of counterfactual to that is, and I'd be interested in your response to this, what if COVID was a lot more deadly? Like if you have a, if you have a position at the moment that I think vaccine passports are completely against human rights. I think it shouldn't be, it's a personal decision, which I completely, I get that argument completely. But let's say COVID was, had a 40% fatality rate. How would we judge, like that reframes it completely. I think baked into those conversations, baked into that discussion that we, that we consider to be a moral absolutes. Like we talk about it as moral absolutes how would that, how would it change? Like there can't be a moral absolute where I'm now being exposed to a potentially like a much higher risk or others are being exposed to a much higher risk. Suddenly those moral absolutes are about no, no one has the obligation to put, to kind of uh, oblige someone to say whether they're vaccinated or not, for example. I still think you, you probably have to have your own decision over yeah, you definitely have to have your own decision over whether you are vaccinated or not, but then knowing other people's vaccination status, that changes the calculation. And I, I, I find it a fascinating thought experiment that I 
came up with the other day. <laughs> Ooh, that's great. That's great. Okay, a couple things. First, backing up to your England thing, uh, Great Britain thing. I'm so jealous of you guys. Like I, I, you guys did it exactly correct. You had a high vaccine rate for most vulnerable people first. Then you had natural infection, which actually created a lot of natural immunity. You opened up quickly and you treated people like adults after that. And your mask policies are perfect. I don't think you ever really shut schools, did you, that much? For like a, a month or two. Yeah, they were closed for a little bit, but then not, not for very long. Not, not persistently. You guys did it correctly. You did it correctly. And in, in like where I live in the Bay Area of California, it's the most thesis oriented, right? Because it's very liberal, very top-down management, you know, uh, that sort of thing. It's been a shit show, dude. Like you have to wear masks outside early days on a trail while mountain biking. A guy yelled at me going by on a mountain bike. I was on a trail without masks with my kids. And he said, mask please. I was like, are you high? There's no data that this hell, and the reactants, the reactants, like, oh my God. Um, but, so I think what you guys did is correct. What you brought up about, what if we dial up the mortality rate? Do you remember in the early days of coronavirus when people were saying, hey, where did the anti-vaccine movement go? They've evaporated because people were terrified. They were terrified of this unknown risk, we didn't know what the infection fatality rate was. Everybody was very um, frightened, like, oh my God, I'm gonna die. We're all locked down. This Paul has come down. And there was no talk of anti-vaccine. Like they disappeared. Well, this is what I think happens. Like, and I just, while you were talking, I drew this little, you can't really see it. It's like a little graphic equalizer. So the moral taste buds are like a graphic equalizer on a, on a audio system. You, they dial up and down based on what the perceived environmental trigger is. If you have a care versus harm value that's here for COVID, because people are like, it's 99.97%, whatever, you know, non-fatal for most people. And then you, you, you come with a vaccine passport. People are like, screw this, man. I'm not gonna die of COVID. No one I know died of COVID, forget it. Dial up the mortality to 40%, people, bodies in the streets, system overwhelmed, mandate anything you want, anthrax vaccine, for example, during a panic, right? Suddenly that, that, that liberty versus oppression goes down to here and the care versus harm goes to here. Sanctity versus degradation goes up because you're like, I don't wanna get this disease and you change how you behave. So that, and I, I think you've, you've backed into what has been such an interesting challenge about this particular type of pandemic. And I've said this on my show, I was like, oh, this is a rounding error on a real pandemic, like a pandemic that that is highly fatal, highly transmissible and poorly understood and completely novel. Okay, that's a that's gonna be a whole different game. Then we've, we've spent all this political capital being assholes about this pandemic, impinging on everyone's liberty, treating people like children, infantilizing them, creating polarity. When the real one comes, it's gonna take a minute before people realize this isn't COVID and and do the things they're supposed to do because we've poisoned them with uh, with something that was a kind of a you know pandemic light. Now that's not to minimize the the suffering and the harm that's happened, but still, Right, still. And we don't talk about the fact that this preferentially affects obese people with chronic disease, elders. You know, Paul Offit on my show said, you know, and by the way, 94% of the deaths are in people 55 or over. So, and, and he's still advocating for kids' vaccines. I'm like, but there's a little cognitive dissonance there. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, that's my rant on that. And there's so much we haven't got through, but I think this is, this is quite a long, a long conversation already. We'll have to do it again sometime. Um, I wonder what the, I mean, I guess the, my kind of final um, thought is returning to the idea of sense making or returning to the kind of the, the difficulty of sense making this. I actually feel a sense of um, hope, especially that I think it was great that Rogan stepped up in the way that he did and hosted Sanjay Gupta. And I think he's articulating the antithesis position pretty well, Rogan. Um, like, certainly in the Sanjay Gupta one, I haven't listened to, for example, the Alex Berenson interview, and I wonder whether there might be something a little bit more uh, extreme in that. But but Rogan generally seems um, 
yeah, that he's articulating it pretty well. He's he he identified quite a lot of the, the genuine issues, the genuine sort of heterodox concerns about um, in the conversation with with Gupta, and also the idea that potentially he could host Pierre Corey in dialogue with someone. I think I think that's going to be difficult because I think Corey has established himself with certain positions that don't really stand up, uh, and also it's very technical data with a lot of kind of uncertainty in some of the some of the trials. But yeah, there's a sense of hope that maybe some of these conversations could be had and there could be a sense of um, some synthesis. I, uh, I agree. That was a sense I got away uh, from watching it or listening to it at three and a half X was a sense of, oh, that was an actual dialogue. You know, you could quibble about things, but I, I thought it was good. And, and I think you're right. Rogan did represent the thesis or the antithesis position well with a little flanking of some irrationality around it, which is fine. And Gupta did the same thing for the thesis. Uh, so I think it actually was a good expression of kind of where we are. And one last piece about it that I forgot to mention, I, I thought it was interesting when Lo Rogan said, you know, the reason I didn't get, I was supposed to get the vaccine and I was going to, but then there was a logistical glitch in Vegas. But then what happened was they paused the J&J. &J, and then I heard anecdotes from friends who got very sick and so on and so forth. And then I, I no longer wanted to do it because I felt like oh, I keep myself healthy. I think a lot of Americans felt that way. You know, the public policies of pausing vaccines and doing things like that without good communication, it, then you reap what you sow when you communicate that way. And so to blame Rogan for behaving like a rational actor in the setting of what he's been exposed to is not, is not fair. So yeah, it was, it was good and I'm glad and actually it was you, David, that turned me on to it actually, because I would have seen it eventually, but you were like, hey, have you seen this? I'm like, no. And immediately I was like 3.5 X, oh, wow. So um, it, it's good that I, I really appreciate what you're trying to do in the world, David. Like seriously, like it, it's very important work. Mm. Yeah, I've really enjoyed um, playing some of these ideas through with you over the last few months or so. So always a pleasure, Zubin, thank you. and. Let's catch up again soon. Thank you, David. We'll just trigger all the all the hateful comments against me now by your by your audience. <laughs> Thank you for watching all the way to the end. And if you'd like to join conversations like this, check out our digital campfire. You get access to a load of member-only films. You can watch live, ask questions, come to our book club, our wisdom gym sessions, and our regular monthly meetups where we share what's going on behind the scenes and you can also connect with other Rebel Wisdom members. What's more, you can also get discounts on our courses like Sensemaking 101. Check out the link below, and we'd love to see you soon.